Hello everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of The LJ Johnson Show. The show airs every single weekend, every Saturday at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, unless specified otherwise, over on Twitter, at The LJ Johnson, where you can find updates and guest announcements every single Tuesday. And if you have any questions over the week, make sure you head on over to my email, ljjohnson at gmail.com. Wow, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of just did that. I didn't, I didn't even think about it. I was just completely, completely autopilot. I'm happy. I'm finally getting in the swing of things over a year later. Okay, so, very excited for my next guest. He is, once again, a returning guest and a good friend of mine. It's, of course, the author of Planet Ripple, as well as the producer and creator of Lego Rewind and many wonderful video essays. It's, of course, Nick Anderson. How you doing today, man? Sup? Oh, hey. I didn't realize you were Batman today. <laughs> no, no, I was trying to make it look like like I was belching at the same time. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome to the Christian Bale podcast. <laughs> today. So, in preparation for today, I went back and listened to the entire previous podcast. You know, I was in a year ago to try to make sure that I don't repeat like ninety percent. Oh, we're gonna things. repeat. We're definitely then, gonna repeat. <laughs> And I, I noticed a couple of things. One, at one point in that episode, around 50 minutes in, I accidentally referred to Planet Ripple as a movie. Ah. I meant to say, like, series or whatever. <laughs> yeah, if Freudian slipped there. I guess the show is uh, my dreams. Anyway, <laughs> the other thing I noticed was um, it has been a year, and uh, the the two Andersons, we haven't fought to the death yet. we got to get to that. Oh, you're right. I guess that's <laughs> true. Well, hey. I'll offer you the opportunity. Are you going to break for Virginia this year? Oh, no, I'm afraid I've. it's hard for me to even get out of state. No, nah, that's fair. That's fair. I understand that. Trust me. Look at where I live. <laughs> but, but all right. I will, I will let Meso know that the, uh, the challenge exists. What, what do you, how, do you want to, how do you want to fight him to the death? Ideologically? Physically? Mm. I, I can. I can. I can. I, can, um, I got it. I got it. Yes. We'll see who can step on the most Legos before killing over. Okay, I'm down for this. This sounds good. <laughs> Whenever I step on Lego, any pieces, uh, with the exception of maybe two, which would be Nujumetru's weapon and Onua's claws, um, I, I, I'm never like incapacitated. Like it, it doesn't take me out completely. It's like, oh, that's uncomfortable. I feel. Confidently, I could absolutely break the record for the longest distance traveled on Lego pieces. It, it just makes me think of that dog, you know, in, in a house fire going, this is fine. I'm totally <laughs> okay with this. I, I, I could do it. Absolutely. Guinness Book of World Records, my name's going to be there one day. For, Except for in, in your case, it would just be loose Lego pieces covering every flat surface. <laughs> Hey everyone, I live in a Lego house. I drink my Lego tea and eat my Lego sandwich. Nice to meet you. Oh my word, you just reminded me of the worst thing. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you're at all familiar with Bennett the Sage and his like anime abandoned reviews, but there was one live action skit where his editor of the time, it's like he was punishing them for something and they had a bowl of Lego pieces, like a bowl of cereal, and oh, they man. had to eat the, the pieces. And it was all special effects. Yeah, you know, it wasn't like actually, like you could hear like, the teeth breaking and everything. I'm like, oh gosh, that's so cruel. What like, again? It was just a skit. What have I always said? Don't eat the pieces. We've been over this. You just shouldn't eat the pieces. It's just ugh. they have the warning labels on the box for a reason. Just saying. <laughs> I wonder if anyone else in the audience has seen that. <laughs> anyway. All right. So. Go ahead, for anyone who hasn't seen our last episode that you were on, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, kind of tell us a little bit about yourself outside of what I mentioned earlier, and uh, go ahead and get into things. I am Nick Anderson. I am, I just turned 28. I have released four books in my graphic novel series, Planet Ripple, which I have self-published. I have more on the way. I try to juggle that um, in moderation with other projects, including videos like my Lego Rewind series, which recently, you know, LJ helped me out a little bit with with a special episode. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, honestly. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll get into that. The process for that in, in a little while. 
Uh, I've also had a very busy last month or so. Um, like there was a lot of stuff happening in March, and then I released you know, Volume Four. That always is like everything kind of revolves around that. I went to a convention, and I wound up on TV a couple of times. Really? Yeah, local news. Um, and I got to tell them a bit about my series and about autistic representation and all that. And I, originally, I thought I would only get the talk for two minutes, but they were a little flexible and let me go on for almost four minutes. So that was nice. Not bad. And I'm going to have a talk at my local library. Uh, I've done a few of those before. This one is on the 17th, so it's not very long from now. And I understand that a couple of my viewers do live in the area. So if you're able to make it there, it's at 530 uh, really, I should have saved that for the end of the episode. Oh, ah, no, well. trust me. It's good uh, to get, so it, get it early as well. So we'll, we'll do it again. It has been an extremely busy several weeks, and I'm, I, I'm not going to lie. I am almost at the breaking point. <laughs> you know, like I am I am strained, and I need things to slow down. Thankfully, they will, like in May. Fair and enough. Time for other projects that I've kind of been neglecting lately while all this real-life stuff comes at me. Fair enough, fair enough. But it sounds like there's a lot of good things. Um, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, and I'm grateful for all these opportunities. It's just when they happen so close together, <laughs> you know, so rapidly. It's like after every public thing, I need time to cool down. It's part yeah. of my autism, but it's also that I'm finding out that I'm also kind of an introvert anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's like after every convention or whatever, I need a couple of days to just sit down and basically just do nothing in my spare time. Uh, to to you know a brain cool down and things have been happening so quickly lately that I haven't really had that chance. I have to constantly be on guard, you know, constantly ready for the next big thing. And again, it's all been fun, and I'm grateful for all of this. But again, I'm I'm gonna need to detox when it's all over. <laughs> yeah, now I get you. Um, I guess one might say that you need to Lego unwind. <laughs> 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 but that is very fair. I, I understand that. But still, that's that's wonderful. That's fantastic. Uh, how how has been? Oh, yeah. how, how's Planet Ripple been doing? Has uh, have you been getting the word out? Been been going? Yes. Well? Yep. Um, I made much more in 2018 than I did in 2017, and you know, we're only not even a full third into this year, and it's already looking to be better than last year. So you know, baby steps. Although I am getting something of a jump. Last year, I was just trying to get the word out there. You know, it's like I hadn't quite proven myself on the proving grounds of the comics industry. And uh, this year, it's been much easier to negotiate, you know, like with certain people to have my books in their stores and so on, or like when it comes to like pricing and so on. That's Last wonderful. year, I would have had to fight a little harder because I didn't have a reputation. You know, and they couldn't have known that there was any demand for my books. Mm -hmm. Now there is going to be a demand, so I have like a stronger, you know, ground to to stand on. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know it's just I'm not used to this feeling, but I'm getting there. <laughs> That's great. Uh, now, would people More be able to power? <laughs> Ultimate power. Um. <laughs> would people be able to find this on Amazon, perhaps? Yes. All four books are available on Amazon for a Kindle and print. And I always have a few copies on hand to sign if, you know, people in the area want, any, uh, want to get any from me personally. That's fantastic. Okay. Excellent. Well, I feel like we will talk a little bit more about that pretty soon here. Uh, but let's start things off with Lego Rewind, since that... That's a very recent thing that just happened. Yes. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and introduce this and uh, and explain what happened. Well, a couple of years ago, I wanted to make a new type of series. Uh, the kinds of videos I was making, game reviews and so on, they were going to be downright ridiculous. Like it would, it, like this one I made about the Metroid Prime trilogy. It took about a month, a one solid month just to get all the footage and edit it together and write the script and everything. It was awful. And I realized I cannot do this sort of thing regularly. I don't know how like some people managed to release videos like that every week. And given everything else that I had to work on, including Planet Ripple, which you know, I was still I was still like developing, I I just couldn't do it anymore. Um so I do videos like that a little more rarely now and I, I needed to do something that was shorter form. You know, just a little easier, and so I made Lego Rewind, 
which you know those videos tend to be a little short like from i don't know seven to ten minutes longer so and it's like i basically take one or two days to write the script and another day to record it and get the audio taken care of and then another couple of days to add footage uh, on a really good run it might only take like three days to put one together uh, sometimes it'll take a week if it's a little longer uh, but it's still much more manageable than having to spend a solid month on a single project. Mm -hmm. And you may have noticed that we're a lot further along with it than we were last time. Last time I'd only made it up to the Exoforce episode. I was talking in the other interview about some of my plans for the, dino, the Dinosaur Themes episode, which include Dino Attack. And now we're, we're about, I'm on episode 30, uh, which will be Time uh, Cruisers. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. You mentioned that at the um, at the end of the most recent episode. And this is going to be a fun episode because it's not. I mean, there aren't that many Time Cruiser sets, but there is a lot of history to the theme and like what went into it, all the multimedia aspects of it. It's going to be kind of like the Alpha Team episode, you know, this deep dive into, you know, what the theme really is. Um, so that'll be fun. But yes, I have 40 episodes of Rewind planned in total, and, well, I've already done 29 of them. The funny thing is, originally, I, I, I would have ended the series right around here. I only thought I could stretch it out for maybe 30 episodes. Uh, I wound up, you know, extending it a little bit longer. And I know I said at the time that I only wanted to cover themes that I was really interested in. And, well, I've wound up covering a few themes that I was not interested in at the time, but have grown to appreciate since. And, you know, sometimes after I release an episode, people will be compelled to buy sets that were featured in it. I said, like, oh, I don't know what to do with this power. I don't know if I can <laughs> wield it responsibly. Even I have succumbed to it and bought a few sets that were in those videos. <laughs> you played yeah. yourself. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Um, so of the episodes that you have, and uh, I will actually go ahead and right here. I'm obviously... His channel will be in the description below. I highly, highly encourage anyone to go check him out. But I'm going to specifically link the playlist in the live chat right over here. Uh, so you can see kind of the catalog that we're talking about. Uh, so of these 29 that you have right now, I feel I already kind of know which one's one you're going to end on. But I won't ask in case it's a secret. Um, of these, which is your favorite thus far? That's very hard to say. Some <laughs> of sorry. the earliest episodes are still my favorites. I love the Dinosaurs episode. I love the Races episode. The, the Aqua Zone episode might be my favorite. I'm just not completely sure. Um, let's see. There's uh, the Vikings. That was a fun way to start that season. Yeah, when I, when I ended season one, people thought it was going to be a while, like at least a few months before I came back to the show. But I wound up releasing that episode just a few days later. And then insectoids, it's like I was on a roll and I realized if I kept going like that, I would burn through the entire show within a matter of maybe weeks. Mm -hmm. So I, I slowed down. But I enjoyed Arctic. I enjoyed uh, sports uh, trains. I'm trying to find one that was really... F oh, Space Police is probably my favorite episode of season two, cool. uh, which ended up being right at the end of the season. And we're just a little ways into season three now. Um, which will be slightly longer than the other ones. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, we've we've I've covered so many themes now that you see before I just had a problem of of people constantly requesting themes that I hadn't gotten to yet and might not even be interested in. Been there and before. Some would just ask about it, and they would try to be polite, but there were also a lot of um, over eager people who would basically bark it at me like review this. Oh, like yeah. it was an order. And I'm oh, like, yeah. gosh darn it, ordering me around like a puppet on strings isn't going to help. And it might be a little different if, say, this were a job and I was dependent on viewers, uh, you know, if I was making money from this. But this is just a hobby. This is yeah. just like this guerrilla documentary style series that I do for fun. And I, I, people just need to respect that I, I just don't take requests. And if there are themes that I decide not to cover in the end, it's because I really could not think of anything interesting to say about them. Mm -hmm. Which I demonstrated a little bit in the latest episode when I first started covering Rescue. But I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, well, let's see. Uh, now, okay, so I still have that problem a little bit for the themes that I have not made episodes about. But now I have a second problem. 
people asking me to cover themes that I already have in <laughs> other, older episodes. I've covered like around 60, 70 by now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, really getting up there. So someone will ask, hey, could you cover uh, Agents? And like, I already did in the Alpha Team episode. Could you cover Atlantis? I already did in the Aqua Th Zone episode. Like, could you cover Galaxy Quest? I already did in the Insectoids episode. Not not Galaxy Quest, Galaxy Squad. Uh, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I try not to show every single theme that I cover in a thumbnail because then you just have this messy collage of, of things, you know, it'd be really hard to look at. I try to keep it at just like one or two images um, of like the old box art. Mm -hmm. uh, but people can just generally take it for granted that if they see an old example of a trope in the video like insectoids, that video will probably also feature the all more recent example of that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it, yes, the Alpha Team episode will feature agents towards the end. The Aguazan episode will include Atlantis and so on. Mm -hmm. anyway. Okay, that's a, that's a fair yeah. clarification. Um, But, but, Nick... What about Hero Factor? Oh, wait, no, you already did Hero Factor. No, I'm <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I know exactly what yes, you're talking I about. Because uh, I, I remember when I was doing the recap reviews, I would have a very similar issue. Like, people would be like, hurry up, come on, come on, get, 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 get to what I want you to review, which is like an 07 set or an 08 set. And I'm sitting here in uh, 05. It's, it's just that lack of, it's that lack of respect for your time. Like, you don't have your own life to live. You really don't have anything better to do or anything else that requires working on it's it's just kind of sad. Yeah, I, obviously the worst it ever got, for me at least, was definitely when I had uh, I reviewed the Mictorin. Like people people know about this; they're very familiar, I'm I'm sure. Where I posted the Mictorin review, and everyone bombarded me. You forgot Nuparu. Where's Nuparu? You don't have Nuparu there, and it's not even so much that. Because cause it wasn't an eagerness thing. It wasn't a, hey, um, I'd really, excuse me, I'd like to see uh, Nuparu. It was, uh, well, it was did, an ignorance did they, did thing. They really think, did, did they really think you were never going to get around to covering Nuparu's set? Well, that early on, probably not. Because a lot of people have started review series. And I'm like, I'm the only guy to have reviewed all of Bionicle right now. Um, and yes, before anyone says that that is just... just I, I know that I haven't done the combination models. That's a whole nother matter, and I'm already I'm finishing up. I just yesterday, I swear to you, I built the 07 system sets. They're coming. They're happening. All Bionicle construction. Anyway, um, so at that time, no. Everyone actually probably assumed, oh, okay, starting out, that's cool. It's another Bionicle project going down the tubes. So, but, but it's like, you're asking for Nuparu. You think I forgot Nuparu in a set about oh in, in a video about O one sets, when Nuparu came out independently in two thousand two. Just it's weird, but I I know exactly what you're talking about. Some people are are just really and I I kind of it's like I'm sure some people are just really eager, like they really like listening to what you're saying and they just want to hear more. It's just there are, there are particular ways of going about expressing that. I'm sure you can agree. Well, they, they just need to understand that it's not that easy to, you know, to keep this going on forever or too frequently. Like, I might get a comment after one episode going like, when's the next episode out? I'm like, gosh, darn it. I just finished this last I, one. I Give saw me a little those. bit of time. I saw comments like that on the, the most recent one, too. And it's like, it, it, it's been like a week. And and look, I'm not upset at any one person. It's It's just that... After a while, those comments get to be in the hundreds. You know, they pile up, and they really start to, like, make my anxiety you know, skyrocket. I'm just like, just, just just, please, e ease up, guys. Yeah, just relax a little bit. They're, they're happening. Just just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. I may, have, I may have gone on a little long about it in episode 26, which began as, like, about Citron, but then, you know, I, I recapped various things that I'd learned throughout season 2 and correcting myself on a few parts. But the last several minutes were just about this thing. And one person commented, um, you know, you could have just said you don't take requests without being a butthole about it. They were a little more uh, explicit than that. I, I assume, but yeah. <laughs> I, guess, I, I, guess I, I guess I could have been. But 
people see. just need to understand that this has been going on for a while now, and I mainly do this series for me to share my love of Lego. Yeah. And if I if I was just making episodes about whatever, and I didn't have anything thoughtful to say about it, you know, if I didn't really care about these themes and it was just lip service, like a kind of job, that would be pandering. Mm-hmm. And I think the best content on all of YouTube is things that, that people are genuinely passionate about. They can give their own unique perspective about. It's like, it, I like to like say, like, whenever someone... S- See, people have this idea that you can be completely unbiased about a topic, and no, everyone has their own bias. Theirs. I have a bias. Mine. You know, everyone Mm -hmm. has their own perspective, and it's important to try to see things from other people's perspectives, but you're never going to be completely removed from your own, and that will inform, like, everything you say. And so I'm just, I'm showing my limits, essentially. You know, I can't just magically come up with something refreshing to say about every little thing especially if i don't know that much about it and again i was trying to show that with uh, the beginning of the rescue episode where i was kind of floundering within the first minute or so and you can see i was like oh i, I can't got come up with a, a way to pad out this episode for longer and it's like how is he gonna come up with like 10 minutes worth of other things to say about this i was trying to show how forced it would feel if i carried on the show like that I was trying to show that hey, this is this is why it's for the best that Lego Rewind eventually end, or at least go to bed until another decade or so goes by, and there are a wealth of new sets to talk about. Mm-hmm. Because I am starting to run out, and I don't want the for I don't want the show to lose steam. I don't want it to eventually become boring, and yeah. I can kind of yeah. start to feel that sinking in just a teensy bit. So I am going to end it in another ten episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel that's reasonable. I think. Yeah, that's a good series length, about forty or so episodes. You know. Well it's like it's like the, the, the your A V G N, your James Rolfe. Um he's he's made a ton of angry video game nerds episodes, but uh, a series that I've enjoyed just as much, if not a little more, are his board games videos. Where you know it's kinda of the same thing, but as a different character and he tackles board games. And he even had this little storyline running through them where it became like some wild creepy pasta thing. And the last few episodes just went off the rails. Now that series was short and sweet. I think he only had about like 26 episodes. If he had tried to keep that going for like a, another 100 or so, I don't think it would be that, I mean, it would have run out of steam. Like he would have run out of board games for sure. It's like, oh wow, a Monopoly episode. No, no, what made that show special was all the weird games that it focused on. And he had the, the he had the good sense to end that show when he did, instead of running into the ground until it was a corpse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, exactly. I mean everything has to have a a limit and end to it. So I'm just saying that if you keep something short and sweet, you know, you just you make the point that you want to and then end on a high note, essentially a mic drop, that makes that thing more memorable and easier for people to digest. If you have this huge backlog because you just had to keep it going forever, I mean, yeah, it'll keep old fans around, but it does end up being a little intimidating for new fans to jump in and, and binge everything. That's why I tried to keep Lego Rewind episodes fairly short. Yeah. And I, I can definitely relate to that, especially given my, my backlog of recaps. That, unfortunately, oh. didn't have much of a workaround for me because of just the sheer... I, I, actually, okay, so 145-ish recap reviews. And that's, that is cut down from 221 individual sets. So that, that is a Oof. consolidation. And I, I still go back and you know watch an old episode now and then. I'm so um, sorry. Just to... <laughs> I'm so so sorry. I recently went back and saw a snippet of like my Takanuva review. Oh, oh, all my lips smacking because I. Yeah. Oh my. Oh my uh, word. Yes, that drives me so nuts. Just... So many people do that so constantly. Fairly recently, I started to catch myself doing it a couple of times in normal everyday conversation. And I'm like, gosh darn it, no, I will not let this become a habit. I will not <laughs> be one of those people who smack their lips every couple of sets. I think some people do yeah, it, or, or <laughs> well, there's there's that, but then there's a sort of clicking, you know, where they mean yeah. like that, 
yeah, on the, on the yeah, roof of their yeah. mouth. Supposedly, some people do that because it helps them talk, so they aren't like constantly flubbing their words uh, because otherwise, you know, they they like be it's, you know they like have a, a lisp or something. It's like a focal point. And it's, it's I a understand point where you can that focus in on and and bounce off of. And I understand that might even be considered the professional thing to do, like if you're a voice actor. But for me, I just can't stand to hear it in recordings. It gives me a oh, yeah. shiver every time. I'm like, Ugh. yeah, no, exactly. I'm I'm sure it's really good for for voice acting. I uh, but at the same time, for voice acting, it gets cut out. Like if you have that, then they just nix it. I mean, there's a reason. That's I mean, I have no doubt that's one of the reasons why Heath Ledger's Joker smacks his lips very frequently. It's supposed to be an unpleasant sound. You don't want to hear it. Yeah, I think that's quite likely. I I definitely it's it's one of those things. It's one of the many things. Looking back at my old reviews, and going, yeah, I would absolutely change that. I think I'd like to think I have to a degree nowadays in the retired reviews, but I'm I'm not sure. Like, I'll record them, I'll edit them, but I don't often go back to watch them. Cubic says, uh, the LJ, Jen- uh, LJ Johnson show we're discussing philosophy with Nick. <laughs> yeah, now we're just, we're just <laughs> discussing little nitpicky things of that, uh, like little pet peeves. Yeah. I think it's about time we talked about the, you know, the most recent episode. Yes, I agree. All right, so. Oh, boy. This was exciting. And for anyone who has not seen the most recent LEGO Rewind, it's LEGO Rewind 29 Res Q. I highly recommend you go see it. And then come back. A- uh, if you're listening to the, the recorded version or if you haven't seen it already, because we're going to spoil it for you, okay? There's a little bit of a twist. It is an April 1st episode. And Nick, you can kind of go ahead and let us in on it. Well, well, what's the twist here? Oh, by the way... um. Yeah, it, it YouTube says that it went up March thirty first because they're going by you know, like West California Coast time. time. Yeah, yeah, but it was past midnight when I uploaded it. You know, it was midnight here in yep. Maine, Eastern Standard Time, all the way, baby. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah, telling people that, um, I just couldn't stay up until like two or three in the morning. But yeah. Anyway, so. I wanted to do something for April Fools, and it was tricky coming up with something that would top the Galador episode, which yeah we went to we went in depth about that one in the you know the previous interview. Uh, that one, you know, we went to another reality like a Twilight Zone scenario, and in that one, Galador became a huge success. Lego basically gave up on everything else they were working on, and I was just talking up Galador as a way to cope with like all the other things I never got. It was a very depressing alternate future. And I played the role of this alternate Nick so well that people at the time thought that I was being serious and were correcting me about things, not realizing it was a skit. <laughs> so this year I had to come up with something to top it. And so I came up with another idea. Now, Bion- uh, people often say that Bionicle single-handedly saved Lego. No, it, it was not just that. That was a, a huge part of it because... Lego wasn't quite out of the woods until the mid 2000s. Um, it wasn't just the 90s that were a, a dark time for them, but it was a combination of Bionicle and acquiring the licenses for things like Star Wars that, yeah, you know, like kind of carried them into that new era. It's like Star Wars helped them get by for another couple of years until they released Bionicle, and that really, like, you know, the two together helped bring them up. Although it cannot be understated how important Bionicle was. Anyway, so I came up with. An idea was like, okay, what if they never acquired the license for that? And then they never released Bionicle. And those like major factors together were enough to kill Lego in the early 2000s. And so other companies like Mega Blocks were able to take over. It was very depressing. <laughs> and I even managed to work in a little something at the last minute. This wasn't even in the script, but I managed to work, insert a couple images of Cybots, kind of implying that Lego, I mean, anyone who knows about Cybot in, in this timeline, uh, talk about it as if the other one existed, that was like the proto Bionicle. It was Christian Faber's first attempt at a ball and socket kind of system. Um, and they never released that theme. And it looked pretty nifty, if weird. 
like the official art looked much cooler than the sets. The sets are kind of ugly, though. If they had been released as a final product, it probably would have been a good deal different. But I was able to work it into the lore with a, just a couple images in the video, subtly hinting that it was the release of Cybots that were the beginning of the end for Lego. Like it was such an unpopular theme that such a badly selling theme, it became this black hole that destroyed people's confidence in Lego. And that's why they didn't get the license of Star Wars and everything. I mean, they didn't want to try like more construction figure stuff because of Cybots. And so that's really to blame for everything that happened. Thank God. Thank Matanui. They didn't release Cybots. <laughs> um, I kid. I kid. Uh, but yes, that was a really fun episode. And well, people may have noticed immediately that it wasn't even me reading the script. It was LJ. Yep. Yep. And I still remember running the basic pitch behind the episode to him, telling him how it's going to go. Like, hey, okay, so I start talking about rescue, but I run out of things to say really fast. I start floundering, and, and then it cuts to you, and I played out the whole scenario. And you were immediately like, okay, th this sounds like fun. Absolutely. And it, it was, because it was so not only was it fun to do, because, you know, it's the bait and switch. I really like that. But it was also fun for me because I got to learn about dragons. Now, I don't have an experience with dragons. Except I remember distinctly seeing the commercials for dragons way, 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 way back when um, intermixed with the Bionicle commercials. And it's like, oh, dragons, that's cool. <gasps> Bionicle, heck yeah! So it was nice to actually learn more about the theme and and see that there was a lot more to it. Like, I did not know that it continued, and it had all these weird space-age dragons, like these weird fighter jet dragons. So, it, it was a ton of fun, and oh, I think this actually was pretty good. Going. It's still going. I mean, just oh. barely. Kind of a shadow of its former self, but they're still releasing the eggs that are full of actual yolk. Uh... And tiny little, like, Matoran-sized creatures who aren't even all dragons now. Only a couple of them are, really. Ah. It's kind of sad how how I wound up. It's really like, Mega Bloks is going through a similar thing that Lego is. You know, they're kind of neglecting any of their own original themes for licensed things like Pokemon and Halo. And by the way, it was really hard for I, I had to be really careful not to let the Mega Constructs logo appear in the video anywhere, because <laughs> I was trying to paint a scenario where they never even had to change the name, where they kept calling themselves Mega Bloks. Mm -hmm. Um. Yes, yes, lots of slime. Happy brick, yeah. Uh, political slime. Ha <laughs> ha uh, No political uh, conversation on TTV Message Oh, wait, this isn't TTV Message Board. Never mind. <laughs> but, Well, yeah. that's the guy's name, is it? Uh, anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, nah, that's him. So what was, what was I going to say next? Um, so it has, they the still have the right? slime, like which is disgusting. Here. Yes, oh my word, that stuff reeked. I remember it smelled so bad. I don't know what chemicals were in it, but I just don't understand like how they didn't get a ton of lawsuits from little Johnnies, you know, ingesting the stuff <laughs> and getting sick, getting brain damage, or or like liver failure. Yeah, it's like they wanted so badly to stand out from Lego. It's like okay, well, Lego's already gotten magnets, so what else can we do? Uh, let's just put snot in everything. Ugh. Ugh. What testing groups do they put that through? To to give to green light that give that the thumbs know. up. I don't know, and it can kind of make sense for some products like TMNT. Like, okay, there was the one barrel uh, like TCRI chemicals that mutated them in the first place, but that wasn't a constant staple of the series. It's not like their sewer layer was full of the gunk. Mm -hmm. It was actually pretty clean, from what I remember. Anyway. Um, Okay, so all the while, as, as you're doing, actually a very good impression of, of my delivery. No, like, we're reading the whole script. That's what I think I want to make clear to people. LJ did not write the script. I It's still, you know, like, my script. But he delivered it e expertly. Like, he, I was surprised <laughs> by how funny some parts of it wound up being. Well, um, I, w I would I would reconsider my career goals if I could not pull that off. <laughs> but all the while... As the, okay, you guys have to remember, TTV formed partly because of 
all these people's mutual fondness for Bionicle. Oh yeah. And they, yeah, and they've stuck together all these years. Except in this other world, Bionicle never existed, so they were never brought together by that. And so LJ didn't become a part of TTV because there was no TTV. Yeah, no. And th throughout the episode, you see all these hints at like in the twilight before time began. You know, it sounds like a time before time, and it kind of sounds familiar to LJ. Mm. And then it's it's like the Freudian slip of like, of like somehow six seems like the right number for this sort of thing. And then he almost says Vardaran instead of Valthran. And so it's like, even though this is another timeline and this is a different LJ, he still kind of sort of remembers some things from this one. Like our world is bleeding into that just a teensy bit. And he's really sad about it, but he doesn't know why. And you yeah. see, it's, it's because he, he never met any of his old friends and he wound up making Megablox videos all the time. And then you see what happened to me. Not only did I never release Planet Ripple, that was a thing that happened in the Galador episode. I I just made like Sonic videos for the last ten <laughs> years. <laughs> yeah, right now you would be talking in that in that world, you're talking about, oh man, we've got some photo leaks from the new Sonic movie. Oh no. <laughs> Take me back. <laughs> Not, dude, aren't you excited? Aren't you excited for live action Sonic the Hedgehog? No, they gave him white hands because he's not wearing any gloves. And this stupid little strip between his eyes to create the mono wire look. I'm like, this stuff isn't necessary. Ah, whatever. <laughs> it, it, it looks it looks goofy to me. But uh, anyway, um, so yeah, things went pretty b badly in that other world uh, for both of us. Oh um, yeah. Again, just the fact that like, I mean, I tried to convey this slight feeling of unhappiness, as if we like both knew that things could have gone much better for us if things were different. But we're looking at our lives like, huh, I, I guess this is just where we wound up. I guess this is just the way things are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yep. it's it's always fun to do these April Fools episodes. Although I'm kind of glad that. Lego Rewind will end before the next April Fools comes along because I don't know what what else there is to do now. Like what yeah. else I could make an episode about to top Mega Rewind? I mean, I guess I could make a Playmobil episode, but nah, 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 nah. I don't want. Ah, uh, but forced. dude, Playmobil episode just in time for the movie? Yeah, no I'm kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> But yeah, no, it was it was a lot of fun, and it looks like everyone really liked it. Everyone had a really good time. But but yes, oh, the, the even scripting... the little Johnny, <laughs> I guess say the little Johnny bit. That was the one bit where he didn't, where you know, LJ didn't sound sad or anything. He wasn't like thinking about it. It just kind of popped out as a Freudian slip. Um, uh, but there was one bit where the delivery was slightly off. It was when you mentioned you know, me, and Nick on Mobius. Uh, you framed it like after making nothing but Sonic videos for the last decade. I, w I kind of imagine you would say like for an entire decade as if it was some kind of accomplishment, you know, that run, like almost like you were impressed by it. Ah, so I see. A little behind the scenes action, but I think, nah, whatever, this is acceptable. I'll, I'll go with this. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Cause yeah. the, the, the way I, the, the reason why I delivered it is, is more so because I have no familiarity with, with Sonic at all. I've never played a Sonic game. I've never thought about playing a Sonic game. I have absolutely no frame of reference. So to me, it's like, he's, he's done Sonic for a decade. I, I've i done Bionicle <laughs> no, no, for a no, decade it's, here. It's fine. Oh, yeah, no. Nah. But I, I no, think no, it worked I out. Make a, I don't want to make a big thing about it. Of I was course. just giving people a little behind the scenes insight of how you know something did sound like slightly different in my head. But that's the case with just about every episode. Yeah. Oftentimes I'll render an episode and then I'll end up rendering it like seven more times because I notice little things that I want to go back and change. I can make myself ill just never getting episodes up. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Oh, wow. We're already 40 minutes into this. <laughs> All right. Well, to wrap up the Lego Rewind, Mega Rewind stuff, I have contemplated at one point making another Mega Rewind episode about Neo Shifters. But honestly, I don't want to do that because then it's like, I'm going to make another one and another one. And it's like, oh, no. Like, a Mega Rewind series, it does sound kind of cool, but it would be too much work, it would be too draining for me, as, as is. Probably because people haven't done nearly as good of a job 
documenting like Mega Bloks's history as they have with Lego. It's pretty easy to find commercials for almost any Lego thing you want on, on like YouTube. Uh, so many people upload these things. You know, they, you got like the Biomedia project for Bionicle. You could find basically anything there. But there isn't something like that for Mega Bloks. Even the Mega Bloks like wiki, I couldn't find actual photos or box art of all of the dragon sets because I guess a lot of them were just lost to history. And that's really sad. Like I wanted to include some block box footage. I found the the like the one that used goo, cyborgs versus mutroids. I could not find that commercial by itself anywhere. But one person did have in a upload like a four or like five minute thing that they record off of a VHS tape. That was an entire commercial break. Um, and so you have like a Fruity Pebbles commercial. You have a, like a bunch of other weird commercials. And in between them all, you had this 20 second um, block bots thing. And like, yes. So I really had to do some deep searching to to find that but it was like that was like the one last thing that really completed the mega rewind episode mm -hmm. hey if, if anyone wants to see another mega rewind in the future you're gonna have to you're gonna have to help me find some material because again <laughs> people just haven't put that much of it up on the internet it's really hard to find mm -hmm. and that makes a lot of sense honestly that uh that that would be the the hindrance there because obviously you can't talk about something that people can't see. So yeah. Oh well. So I guess we can talk about, I guess Planet Ripple for a little bit. Yeah, no? yeah. Let's uh, let's go back to that. So go ahead and uh, feel free to reintroduce everyone to it. Uh, tell us a little bit about what it is, and uh, again, how, how things have been, what the process has been like, and what the future looks like. All right. Well, the future is looking brighter with every year that goes by. Okay, so I want, to, I want to make a clear distinction that plot and story are two completely different things. I think people tend to focus too much on the plot of a story, on the world building, the literal skeleton of it, just the point A to B of the, the quest, and not enough on the emotionals, you know, the character's internal journey, what they learn about themselves. Um, now, I, I, I do have a plenty of world building in this story, but I do focus first and foremost on uh, just the, you know, the character's own struggles. Um, you do kind of need both. You know, if I didn't have this interesting world for Mila to live in, it would feel kind of like a PSA. But if she isn't, like, at the center of it, it, you know, it would be kind of empty, I guess. Anyway. Okay, so Planet Ripple. It's about a woman with autism. Um, with like multiple disabilities, really. She also has a physical one. She was born with four stumps, and so she requires prosthetics just to get around and do anything. And those are pretty common. You know, cyborgs are very common in this future world. Uh, but at the very start of it, she's destitute. Like for most of the entire first volume, she can't afford very good parts. But she gets opportunities as the series goes on. She gets you know better pieces, and so her quality of life improves. But as for, you know, what the character's like inside. So yes, she is autistic. I'm autistic. And I just don't care much for how I represent him most of the time in media. And this is where I'm going to start repeating myself a little bit, like from the last interview. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you have a ton of stories, Lifetime movies and so on. Where you'll have a character who's a screw up at just about everything because of their condition. Like, it'll be exaggerated. And yes, there are some severe cases, but oftentimes that's like the only version we see. And yet, they'll have this one neat trick, this one special gift that redeems them, essentially. It's like, oh wow, he can count faster than a computer. Now he's worth something. And that's just not the reality for most of us in real life. We don't have that one neat trick that like impresses people at, at parties or whatever. But it creates this weird pressure where... You know, you might be at a party or something, and someone will ask, oh, your son's autistic. What's his talent? You know, what's his special gift? Because they all have that, right? That's just part of being autistic. No, it's more of a sensory thing, and it's different for everybody. You know, it's worse for some than others. Um, it's like the ugly duckling. If he doesn't become a beautiful swan at the end, does that mean the other ducklings were correct to pick on him? That they were right? Of course not. Um... And just like that, you know, we shouldn't have to justify our existence way. We should just be interesting people without that. And that's what I try to do with Minnow. I didn't want it to be terribly obvious. No one in the story ever calls her autistic or, you know, calls it out by name. 
but you see it manifest in some of her behaviors. Not to a point that's obnoxious, but you do notice little things. Like she won't understand what certain like social cues or gestures mean. She'll be overstimulated by lights or sounds or so on, especially in flashbacks to when she was a child. And it was a fair bit more obvious. Um, but I, I started the story when she's already 25. Because we focus so much on autism in, in kids, you know, on like how to fix your child as if there isn't any such thing that it creates this weird impression that autistic adults don't exist as if we just go away after a while like something happens to us at 18 we go away and then, no that's not it either i wanted to show what it's like to have to live with this day in day out for your entire life you're the only person you're going to spend your entire life with so you better learn to you know you better learn to love yourself and it's just something you have to adjust to constantly, little bits here and there as you try to improve yourself. And this next part, people tend to put autists in, in a box. Like if you're too functional, they'll try to say, oh, you're not really autistic. Or like, have you really been diagnosed? I have actually been asked that a couple of times, even by people that I thought I, I could trust, that I thought knew me. And it, it's because they basically imagine that I mean, they just imagine it being like a, an adult who's non and needs a diaper. And if you have like any less than that, well, you're not really autistic. You just diagnosed yourself after reading about a little bit on the internet. So oh, I have been diagnosed a few times throughout my life and I still have it. It's not something I'm ever going to be without, but I'm able to hide it a little better than I, I used to be. It was much more obvious when I was a kid. I had a lot of hurdles to jump over, and I, I have. And th th this is the part that's kind of hard to say. I see some people who kind of wear it as a badge of honor, who essentially make it their entire personality and just kind of resign themselves to it. And that's really depressing to me, because I've worked very hard throughout my life to improve myself, to not let it completely dominate me. You know, I like to think that no one is their disability, that is not their entire personality, that is not the only interesting thing about them. And it breaks my heart when I see some people who have so little confidence in themselves that they do essentially let it become their entire identity. And they don't try to improve themselves, either because no one in their family really urged them to or, or they just kind of revel in it. Now, I understand for some people it is so bad, like sensory-wise, that they do kind of need to shut the world out. Like I said, even I have some things like that. But for some people, like they can't make eye contact. That used to be a big problem for me. Uh, they can't hug anyone because it like any sort of touching hurts. Like I've known a couple of people who couldn't even take a shower because of the sensation. I kind of understand that because I can't even drink soda because the carbonation on my tongue feels like needles stabbing me. It's awful. And there are some noises that I also can't stand. Like recently, I went to a church where my little cousin was singing and I wish I could hear her. But the acoustics of the place, it hurt. Like the, the vibrations through my feet and my chest and my head. I, I had to leave part way through. And it looked weird that I was getting up to walk outside. Like people th probably thought I was going out for a smoke or something. But I just couldn't stand it. It was physically painful. And it's funny because like I swear certain things have actually gone harder in adulthood than they were when I was a kid. Um, but anyway, boy, I've been rambling on about this for way too long. Okay, I just told people a ton of things about autism, but I want to make it clear. Again, I try not to make it that obvious with the character because I didn't want her to be someone that only autistic people or autistic like sympathizers could relate to. She goes through the same struggles that other people do. Like You've got things like survivor skills, your depression, mood switch. You even got PTSD. You know, you have certain scenes where she like relives certain traumas like losing someone. And it's just further compounded by that extra layer of baggage of sensory overload that comes with something like autism that makes it even harder to work through those issues that are already difficult for, you know, normal people. And I, I wanted to show that, but she's still ultimately a normalish enough person who doesn't have the one gimmicky super just trying to make it through the day and find purpose and meaning in life like everyone else and hopefully the people around her won't make that too difficult like the way i see it if she needs the one special trick to be interesting then like what's even the point of the story and this is like numerous characters in it with disabilities 
is I don't make the disability like their one trait, their one note. I try to make them interesting as people overall. And oftentimes I won't even reveal the disability they have at first. Um, Cause I figure they should be interesting even without that. It's just having them makes them even more interesting. Okay. I've been talking for way too long. You, you say something. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're all good. All right. Well, it gives us a little bit of uh, of writer insight. And so yeah. when, it, when it comes to the series now, you're at uh, four novels. Is that correct? Yep. And things have gone pretty crazy. Uh, I said last time that I was like working on volume three and that I was like the most proud of that one. I'm actually much more proud of volume four now. What's funny is I, I developed the first two books at once because I'd originally planned for them to be one giant 300 page book, but that would have cost like $50 per copy. That would have scared people away. So I had to find a good place to split up around the middle. I added an extra couple of scenes to the end of volume one, just to tie it up nicely and lead into the next one. Um, but volume three was actually harder to work on than those two combined. It wound up being a little longer than each of the other ones, but it also just had so much going on in it that it wore me out by, by the end of it. And you can kind of see it in minute two. She's exhausted by the end of it because like, so many things happen that wear her down until she just needs to like retreat into herself for a while and just, you know, again, not do anything. And yet in volume four, I finally found my rhythm. Like I found a good pacing for things. I really liked how it you know came together and you could kind of see that in Minnow too. How like she starts out in a pretty good place in life. I think still kind of unravel towards the end because I have to escalate the story. Uh, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the basic plot of it, again, this is the skeleton of the story. We were just talking about the emotional meat of everything, but the actual plot of like the world, uh, the world's been flooded for th many thousands of years. Uh, you know, not just a few generations. And it wasn't even global warming. It, we had actually fixed that, but then something else happened that flooded the world, which I will not explain for a good long while until later in the story. Anyways, it's gotten to a point where most people don't even believe there ever was any such thing as land. They think it's a fairy tale. But new lands do start appearing, very suddenly, left and right. And so now there's a struggle over who gets the new lots. And the elites of the world, they hire a vicious pirate gang to reserve it for them, to keep anyone else from coming near it. And one thing leads to another, Minnow has a couple encounters with them, and she ends up roped into that whole mess. And it just spirals on from there. Um, but... In, in terms of like themes, I I mean, this is where I am starting to repeat myself from last time. <laughs> I tackle scapegoating because I, I hate how like these days we have the most vulnerable members of society, the most vulnerable groups being targeted as if there's some kind of a threat to the majority. And it's something that I've noticed like throughout history. Anytime the powerful want to draw attention away from their own misdeeds, they'll point people to their own neighbors. They'll say, hey, you know, hurt each other you know, don't look up at what we're doing look down at yourselves at your own kin and, and fight each other and unfortunately it is a tactic that works all too well uh, even today and i'm trying to discourage that i'm trying to spread not just awareness of things like autism because it's easy to spread awareness of everything scary about conditions like that and just leave it there i want to spread acceptance of such people you know to, to spread kindness and that's uh, the one last thing that bugs me is when people are like, no, you don't want to normalize it. W why? Did they think that one day everyone is going to wake up like this? No, I just want people to be kind to those of us who are already here and to be accepting. I want to, you know, make us seem more normal through characters like Minnow. Not so strange or alien. Anyway, okay. is there anything you want to say? Um, no, I've... right now, where you are at the moment... Do you pl how long do you plan a series? Because obviously we talked before about you know wanting things to have a certain length and not going on for too terribly long, but I'm sure you have kind of a thought process as to to how long you want the series well, to go. I'm on I'm on volume. Well, I've started working on volume five already. I estimate the series will end up being about fifteen books in the long run, because uh, this first arc is like six books. Because I had to establish a ton of of the world and of Minos' character herself. But once that is established, future um, stories will be a little shorter. Like, we'll say three volumes each. And I'll just tackle each one as if they were a movie, you know, in a series. Um, like, you could say 
volumes seven through nine will be its own self-contained story kind of like a movie split into three parts and the next three after that will show how the world became flooded i don't want to keep it going on forever i'm just trying to tell a chunk of the story i'm trying to say something important with every book you know as if they are chapters in a longer novel um if I didn't think there were things to say, I, this series wouldn't be as long as it's going to be. The only reason it's that long is because I do have something to add with each chunk of it, uh, within, you know, like 150 pages each. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. All right. Um, I mean, at least uh, that creates plenty of time for it to keep growing, you know, in, in popularity before it's over. Give people something to look forward to for a good long while. That is true right now with the series which obviously people can purchase um well what are your your goals moving forward as far as adaption do you ever want to see it become a, a novel outside of a comic or do you want to see it or graphic novel rather uh, as opposed a novel a written novel as opposed to a graphic novel there we go that's the that's the I, phrase i could see that happening i might not do it myself but you know the if if someone else is willing, I mean, I don't know. It, the stars would have to line up just right. If it was a writer that I really liked and who seemed to understand the story, okay. But I'm not just going to let you know, anyone do it. Of um, course. Although I, I am okay with people creating their own fan fictions that take place in that world if they want to like, come up with their own character who lives in a different part of it, so long as they don't try to make any money off of it and they credit me. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see what yeah, else. Uh, you, you own... I, um... You own the copyright, is that correct? Yes. I have the trademark. Trademark. Uh, okay, this is the thing. Of, yeah. Someday I'm going to make a video that's just about getting your own trademark for your own series. That's something that I know would help a lot of people. And the process really wasn't that difficult. It just took a long while. But here's the thing. Anyone who has created something can put a TM next to it. You do have the trademark as long as you really made this own world of yours. But you can't enforce it. Uh, it's enough to turn most people away, but there are always going to be a few bad actors who are just savvy enough to realize, ah, that means it isn't registered. You see, if you ever had to take this to court and you wanted the government to, to back you up, you have to pay to have it registered, which again takes a while. Um, and uh, basically it just means you could slap a nice shiny R next to your work which will give it an extra layer of protection. And then, like, anyone who's smart won't even think of touching it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's, that's what I did with this. Because I really had faith in it and I really wanted to protect it. Um, but I would, I do hope that someday, you know, it may become a cartoon or a video game, you know, with music and everything. Uh, that would be fun. Although I'm not sure, like, if it wound up becoming, becoming a, a movie, it would have to be done in a very particular way. Like, I wouldn't mind if it was, say, all CG or something like that. Um, I'm still thinking about it. I do want it to go places, but right now I'm just trying to get into more bookstores and so on. That's understandable. That's that's perfectly fair. Um, while we're on the subject of uh, the legalities of things, would you like to go ahead and make a clarifying statement on some similarities to something else that might be showing up? Yes. Go for it. Okay, so... There's this little thing that I unfortunately have not been paying very much attention to until recently called Rebel Nature, created by Christian Faber. Mm -hmm. You know, basically the, the guy who like created like all the Bionicle. You know, I grew up with Bionicle. I was a big fan of this guy's work, uh, but I'm not subscribed to his channel. I, I don't know. I just never really got around to it. And I am not, I was not that familiar with Rebel Nature, which I think is alternatively called Waveborn, which, oh my word, it's like looking in a mirror. It's a very similar world. It's a character who looks almost exactly the same as Minnow, very similar machinery and creatures, and it just makes my heart sink. Um, I'm like, make no mistake, I'm not. I'm not saying anything about Faber. I'm more so like panicking about what this means for my own work because I am worried about people accusing me of ripping Faber off. You know, that they, they might look at Planet Ripple and think, 
oh my gosh, this is just like Battle Angel Arlita and Rebel Nature put together. You know, like I even got a, co a comment like that today and that prompted me to go and watch some of Faber's videos. And the more I saw, the more I just, it, it just bummed me out because I worried, oh great, now I'm going to have to defend, you know, against like accusations of that from now on, probably. Um, thankfully, you know, like there's no real like actions that could be taken you know it's like i've trademarked my work i'm sure he's trademarked his so you yeah, know like we're just gonna leave each other alone but it's still just one of those things like there's already the water world aspect you know early on when i revealed planet ripple people made comparisons to water world and then some made little comparisons to things like bonacle or Mega Man legends and yes i was like a little like inspired by all those things a little bit but i was still trying to you know create my own original world and it's not to say that like redheads with freckled faces and so on aren't fairly common you know there's no like no one can have a monopoly on that kind of character it's just kind of stunning to me how similar the two wound up being and this is something that happens a lot um you know like you'll have two creators two authors who just happen to create you know very similar things around the same time I think we, we, we do have very different stories. It's just the, you know, the look of them is kind of similar. But this is something that you also see in the science world. You'll have two scientists who happen to make the exact same discovery around the same time, just because they're both like that advanced in terms of technology. It's called multiple discovery. And I guess I just hope going forward that people understand that. Like I first drew Minnow I can't even remember if it was very early 2014 or very late 2013. It was right around New Year's. It was at a birthday party of sorts for, for someone else. I was just a little bored. I grabbed some paper and I doodled her and I just, I liked how she looked and I just went on from there. Mm -hmm. And the point is I've been working on this for a long time. I released the first, first books years ago, but you know they were in development a good long while before that. And Rebel Nature is still in development but you know Faber's got more of a reputation than me you know he's the guy who made Bionicle you know tons of people love Bionicle and if they don't look at the dates you know it's just easy for someone to get that impression to come across his work and then mine and then assume that I ripped you know Faber's work off and I don't know I doubt Faber's ever gonna know about this um, but if he did, I, I guess I just wanted to make things clear and I just didn't want there to be anything weird between us. Again, we just both happened to come up with kind of similar looking worlds in a pretty short time frame. It just happened to be kind of on the same wavelength. But it does seem that we have very different priorities with the types of stories we want to tell. You know, the themes, the morals, and so on. So at least they're different that way. It's just one of those things and i'm sorry for rambling about that i my old statement probably wasn't nearly as coherent as i was hoping it would be <laughs> nah that's fine but yeah so i think it's it's good to have that out there and let people know about that and make people aware because to be honest i i think i think you're fine because obviously planet ripple exists it's out it's in stores now um and rebel nature has nothing they have a few crowd shell songs, a buttload of concept art, and that's it. So one thing's out, the other is not. It's just kind of, kind of, kind of the way it is. Which is why I have doubts about Faber's uh, more recent initiatives in the BIO section of things. So. Yeah, we'll get to that in a sec. I, again, I'm just, I just wanted it to be on record that you know i didn't know about I, I didn't really know anything about rebel nature as i was coming up with planet ripple you know i didn't even like it was only in the last year or so that i even saw any of his character design concepts for res and even back then i was just like oh no like this is gonna be a thing that i'm gonna have to deal with now and i mean look i don't want anyone to get the impression that i don't like rebel nature or, or Waveborn, whatever he ends up calling it, I still don't know what he's decided on. I am happy to see Faber at work on something new and something really his own that doesn't have to be restricted, you know, by something like Lego. 
I am glad to see that the man is busy and still creating amazing art and, and worlds. Um, when I say that I'm disheartened by it, it's just that, you know, now there's going to be like that extra stigma, I guess, looming over my head. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, I think everything should be fine. But again, it is good to have that statement out there. So that being the case, um, is there anything else you would like to discuss pertaining to, to a planet ripple or shall we, uh, move into the well, that's bio? The thing. <laughs> that's the thing. There are a few things I could say, but again, we, I'd just be repeating myself from the last time. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I will say one thing. Uh, things aren't quite that bad now in terms of autism and how autistic people are treated, but it, it is still there and it is still depressing to see how little progress has been made. Um, like back around 20, the 2010s, there were certain individuals who were getting big on the internet for all the wrong reasons who gave autistic people like me a bad reputation. They made it a meme. You know, they would, they would behave in very creepy ways. It would just be a big jerk and they would blame it on their autism. They say, I can't help it. I'm autistic. That's why I act this way. And so it became this stereotype and people like me have had to deal with that. And try to combat that perception it's oh man it has become like back then it was really extreme people like me at that at my younger age were afraid to reveal that we were autistic because we knew that we would be dogpiled at the time thankfully it's not quite that bad now people are a little more accepting of it you know it's not that kind of thing where you'll be chased off the internet for it but it does mean that people won't take you very seriously because of it and I see all these jokes where like, oh, if you like, if you like Sonic, you're autistic. If you like, you know, Thomas, you're autistic. If you like The Last Jedi, you're autistic. You know, people basically saying that if you at any point ever appreciate these things, your opinion just can't be taken seriously because you're just a little baby that doesn't know any better, doesn't know like the objective reality of things. And it's, it's just sad. Like probably the worst example of this I saw was there was that incident at a gaming tournament you know that that shooting and there was a response from one guy who i believe was actually there like with his kid and i understand if this was just kind of him venting to deal with the trauma of it but i still don't think it's a good excuse for what he said he basically tried to say that all these you know these people who do this they're always these skinny nerdy types and he then delved into autism and he said, you know what, how about outside of these things, you, like outside the entrance, you just put down a little wooden toy train. And if anyone stops and even so much as it looks at it, they don't get to go in. That, oh my word. It's not just that it's offensive. It is completely maligning us. You see, this is what I was saying, like how it's easy to spread awareness of all the bad parts of things like autism. I just leave it at that. But that just further maligns us. You know, it doesn't spread like understanding of us. And when I see that kind of rhetoric, where it's like, oh, you know, just put a little toy train out and, and then don't let them in because they might be the next big shooter or whatever, that was just the craziest thing. And the sad thing is I haven't just e even heard this stuff on the internet. I have heard people in the real world in person say, suggest that, you know, certain criminals might be autistic, as if that makes them a sociopath. You know, it's just part of that perception that autistic people don't have feelings, that we don't have empathy or basic emotions, which is bullcrap. But that's why I do what I do, because that perception has not gone. It's gotten a little quieter, but it's insidious. You know, it's still festering. It's still there. And it's probably always going to be there, but maybe I can make it not quite as bad as it is right now. Oh boy, that got really heavy. I'm I'm sorry. I'm just saying that this is all very important to me. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Well, that again, I'm I'm really sorry for getting kind of heavy about. It. I'm go. basically just saying that stories like Planet Ripple are necessary in a way because I don't want like any autistic teen, you know, anyone who's just or even an old person who's just finding out about it because it wasn't diagnosed when they were younger. I don't want anybody to, you know, be, be miserable because 
I, I don't want them to think that everyone is right to hate them. You know, it's like that ugly duckling thing. I want to show them that they, they can be accepted. I want to spread that compassion. Okay. Just trying to end that tension on a more positive note. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, that'll be in the case. We should actually start wrapping up soon. So, uh, Nick, would you like to answer some questions? Yes. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, All right. In that case, I'm going to go ahead and open up the, uh, the YouTube live chat to some questions. And we actually, and the reason I'm doing this is we actually have an email question that was sent in on this subject. So the, the dinosaur planet asks, uh, hi, Nick. I have a question about non art, uh, non art, autistic people who sometimes act autistic. I'm not autistic, but I have some autistic like tendencies, like kind of zoning out mentally in crowded places. What do you think about people like me? And do you think we could have autism? What is up with that? And would people think I have autism? That's the thing It's still pretty vague. Um, it's easy to diagnose in some people and some others, not so much. There's a lot of overlap with other things like ADD or ADHD, you know, but I do think it's more common than we ever thought it was. I mean, there's a reason they call it a spectrum. I don't really like calling it a spectrum much because that does imply that people towards one end of it are worse than people towards the other end. But it is like a gradient. You know, everyone does fall somewhere different on it. Um, I think it's just the only reason it seems like there are so many more people with autism now than there used to be. I don't think it's just things in the air or whatever making it worse. I think we're just so much better at diagnosing it now than we used to be. You know, we've gotten better at detecting it. We know what the signs are now. We can pick up the symptoms much easier than we used to be even a couple of decades ago. It's like they didn't even know that I was until, what, like, I don't know, like it, they, my parents had a feeling when I was a baby, but I wasn't officially diagnosed for a few years after. That. Although, if it were today, you know, if I were just growing up now, they probably would have detected it sooner because, like I said, they're just getting better at it. But for people who think they might be autistic but aren't completely sure, I'd say don't rule anything out completely. Just try to learn as much as you can about yourself. You know, do get a diagnosis of some kind. And if you find out that you're not, um, I mean, don't be discouraged by that or anything. I mean, I understand it's easy for people to feel like there's something wrong with them inside and they want to be able to pin it on something that's easy to describe, but it's not always. Like I said, every, everyone's different. And even for those who are autistic, it's different for everybody. Um, I hope that was coherent enough. Yeah, that, that works for me. Okay. In that case, so we have some questions in the YouTube live chat. Uh, I'm actually, this one came before we started opening the questions up, but I'm going to ask it anyway from Tesla Effect, who asks, have you ever considered contacting Faber and talking to him before he finds out about Planet Ripple through other means? I haven't really had that much time to think about it. I really started thinking today because, again, I didn't like understand just how much there was until recently. But if it was possible for me to contact Faber at some point, I mean, geez, I grew up, you know, with the guys working Bionicle. It, it, it'd be amazing if it ever happened, but I don't know how it would happen or, or what, and I'm almost afraid to do it. Just because, like, what would I even say? Um, but I guess I'm going to have to try to reach him at some point just to... I guess just to get it all out there. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm just not sure how. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. Well, I'll tell you right now. Honestly, even if you did reach out to him, not a good chance of getting a reply. He's notoriously reclusive. So. Right. But, all right, next question. Do, 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 is, uh, okay, here we go. Okay, so, Jeremy Jason asks, did you ever connect with any one Bionicle character and is Bionicle a form of inspiration for what you do? I have connected with numerous Bionicle characters, but I think the one I connected most might very well be Takua, um, partly because of the Bionic, I mean, the Manui online game. Uh, I know he didn't talk very much in that, but 
it was just something I loved about the main character being this little guy, this misfit that no one really liked very much. In fact, if you look at the blogs uh, being posted by people who worked for, for Templar, uh, talking about like the process of making the game, the whole Chronicler's company, you know, all of them, they, it's like they, they weren't even like the main cast of Matoran, uh, save Maku. You know, it was mostly the misfits, a Limitoran who can't fly, uh, a Pomatoran that no one likes, a Ko Matoran that can't talk. Um, I really identified with those characters uh, very early on, and I love them throughout the whole thing. And it's why I did enjoy seeing characters like John Taro and so on become Toa later on in the story, because it made a nice through line like back to the beginning of it. Um, but yes, I do think that uh, Takua might be the character I identified with the, the most. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay. The next question is from Spidey Central, who asks, Nick, how did you get so into Bionicle? Okay. Well, actually, I I, I, I will say, it's, sorry, one last thing. Um, I was an inspiration for what I do. Uh, yes, because it taught me like, that there are, you can tell different kinds of stories. Like with Bionicle, we never really see anything like it before. You had these mostly mechanical looking beings who used to have an incredibly advanced society with ivory towers and spaceships and all that, and then they lost it all. Not because anyone died, really, but because they just forgot about it and they regressed to being like cavemen. Now, of course, we wouldn't understand all of that for a good few years, but even at the beginning, just that you had these beings in a tropical island setting like that was fascinating to me. And it just broadened my horizons of what different types of characters you can tell stories about. You know, what, what different types of worlds you can create that I hadn't considered at that young age. Um, like, it's, it is technically a, a cyberpunk thing. Like, it's, it, the characters, they are cyborgs, but kind of reverse cyborgs, where instead of being mostly fleshy with a few mechanical parts... They're kind of like a walking metal ant. I mean, an upright walking metal ant with just a few squishy organs and muscle fibers holding the mechanical bits together. That is so fascinating to me, and they don't make it creepy or weird in the least. They make these characters incredibly easy to identify with, but making them kind of childlike, you know? Anyway, so yes, Bionicle was a, one of you know, many inspirations for me growing up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how did I get into Bionicle? Well, it... If you haven't gotten like the idea far, I was there right at the beginning. I fell in love with it immediately. Uh, in the Technic Lego Reboot episode, I kind of mentioned that I'd once seen a catalog that had these two big images of Tahu and Anua, uh, with the other four like off in the corner. Maybe I don't even remember if they were there or not. But just those couple of images, I was in love with it immediately. And then I went to the to Toys R Us, and I got Gally, and my brother got Kopaka, and I found out later that day that Gally was a girl. Which, was, again, was so fascinating to me. Just that, like, they didn't look remotely like people, but they could, you know, identify as, like, one or the other. Um, and while well, I watched the videos on the little CDs that came with them, and that really cemented my fondness for the series. And then I started going on the Bionicle website every single day, and I played the Manui online game. Uh, with its horrible load times where each image, each screen would take like 30 seconds. Oh boy. But I went through it all. You know, it was worth it. And I I kept up with it from there. But yes, it's, I mean, for people who are probably thinking it'd be something more interesting, nope, it's just that I happened to be there at exactly the right age, at exactly the right time to dive into it right as it was starting. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay. In that case... Have I ever eaten a mangosteen? No, I have not. This was asked by Tesla Effect, and that that being the case. Next question by Diesel. Uh, thoughts on the bio Instagram post by Faber. So, Faber's new initiatives. What are your, oh boy. your general thoughts? I am fascinated by this too, because it's so different. Like it's clearly a Bionicle something, but it doesn't look anything like the old Bionicle logo. It doesn't even look like anything from who. It's like this completely new world with its new look and its 
Um, it might be a turnoff for some people who really just can't get their heads out of those old days who want Bionicle to be exactly the same. But what I love about this is it has a whole feeling of newness about it. What really drew me into Bionicle back in the day was, again, how fresh and new and different it was from anything else that I was exposed to. And this has that same feeling. By being so unlike the original, it ends up being nostalgic for me because it recaptures that feeling of something totally unfamiliar that I'm just getting to know for the first time, assuming it, there's anything more to it than just this one image. Assuming it was anything more than an April Fool's thing. I mean, it almost feels like that might be the trolling aspect that he expects us to think is just an April Fool's prank, but it's actually totally legit. <laughs> that would be funny. But it, this is kind of like what I was trying to do with Nova Orbis when that was still a thing that I still have not found the time to get back to, is that people enjoyed that because it was a different world, you know, a different trisomatoran, a new aesthetic, and yet it took them right back to those early days when they were just discovering this entire world that had been all laid out for them. This is that same feeling, and this is what I love about Bionicle, is that it can be reinvented time and again, which, you know, it's like they tried doing in some ways with G2, and not enough in some other ways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fair enough, yeah. I, I, I just don't think anything's going to come of it, just due to Faber not really following through on yeah. things as of late. However, I'm happy to be proven wrong. So. Yeah. Okay, next question from the Clone Ranger, who asks, do you have any Bionicle set that you think is underappreciated? Love the series and the books. Well, thank you. Um... Yeah, quite a few. I would say some of the Glatorian sets are underappreciated. Granted, some of them are a little flimsy, but I do love how many pride with them. The more elemental color schemes, like in the early days. You know, the uh, sorry, the, the specialized elements that looked like thorns or icicles or flames. They looked more like Toa than many of the actual Toa we'd be keeping up with for years. And... I'm just kind of sad we never really saw anything like that going forward. I mean, if Bionicle hadn't been cancelled, if Hero Factory hadn't, you know, taken over, I have no doubt that we would have seen CCBS elements pop into these sets in, like, 2011. But that's what the Element Lords and so on might have looked like. Um, but, you know, who knows? We never quite got that far. But, uh, yes, I think the Glatorian are fairly underrated. And this is probably going to sound weird, but another thing I think is kind of underrated are the 06 Voyatoran. As strange as they are, as poorly built as some of them like Kazi are, I do appreciate how weird and, and different they were. I do think like Balta and Peruk and Garan, they, I do think they have quite a bit of character to them. Um, and I don't know, I just, I'm just i just thinking like every other wave of Matoran or Rahaga even, had something to them that was, like, I guess sort of specialized. The Voyatorian didn't really have anything. They were just things you could make out of pieces that you had laying around, and to me, that's what LEGO's all about. That's what, like, the best LEGO sets are. Um, or, like, what best capture the essence of it. Anyway, so yes, I love the Glatorian, and I love the Voyatorian. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let me see. It's, I, I, I agree with you on the Glatorian wholeheartedly. I am going to skip this question for now since I'm sure you've answered it. So I'm going to go to this one by Tizzle Effect. Nick, can you tell us a bit more about why you love the sea and the depths of the sea so much? I have similar fascinations with the sea and stormy rainfall. It's because I have salt water in my veins. <laughs> uh, no, no, that, that wasn't hyperbole. That wasn't me exaggerating. Um, my ancestors were people of the sea, you know, like sea captains. I, you know, we have this like special place near the ocean that we go to every summer, like as many times throughout the year as we can. And it's just really nostalgic for us. But it's like, yes, it's pretty common in my family that we like to be near the ocean because it's just kind of built into us because of our family history. Like we've been there for hundreds of years. Um, well, at least a couple hundred. Um, so that's quite simply it. It's just a very important place to me, and I'd never like to be too far away from it. Okay. All right, fair enough. Uh, Brother W asks, question, 
What are your opinions about people comparing the latest black hole picture to Nuvak Kal's death? Sorry about that. I, I, uh, sorry, someone was in another room. Um, turns out, uh, we've actually been there since like 1620. That's actually pretty uh, far back. It's further back than I thought. Okay, so sorry. What, were, what, was, what did you just say? Fair enough. No problem. Uh, Brother W asks, what are your opinions on people comparing the latest black hole picture to Nuvok Call's death? Ooh. Hmm. Well, I don't, I don't know. Nothing out of the ordinary there to me. Um, he was compressed until he became his own black hole, and uh, this is a black hole we're seeing now. Okay, I mean, if if anyone's like photoshopped Nuva call into that picture, then I'll be interested in seeing it. But yeah, this is the funny thing people don't understand about like gravity powers. The idea of, is that once an object becomes heavy enough, once you have enough mass in a small enough space, it will con it will it will collapse on itself. And that's essentially what happened to Nuva Kal. You know, he became smaller than like the size of a molecule, and then he died. Uh, it's kind of like what happens to Ant-Man. You know, those scenes where he goes subatomic? You take the weight of like a 150, 60-ish pound man and put it in a tiny space. He will collapse and become a black hole that will eat up the Earth. So, wow, that's pretty dangerous. Anyway, I, I don't know really what to think of it. If people can make that comparison. Um... Okay, fair I enough. I guess not much else to say. Okay. Tesla Effect asks, Nick, what future projects do you have planned after you finish LEGO Rewind? Quite a few. I'm going to have to get into um, videos about writing, about storytelling, uh, about movies and so on. One thing, I, one video I made a few months ago was about Spider-Man, specifically how I would tell the Spider-Man story very differently. And people really liked it. And I do plan to make more. I haven't been able to make more recently because of all the things I have going on, but things will slow down. And especially as like Lego Rewind is phased out, I will make more of those videos. I'll make like, I don't know, five or six more of them, uh, tackling all the different characters and storylines that I would try to do differently. Um, people really enjoy my Battle Angel two-part review, um, so I'm definitely going to make more videos about... I mean, I don't want to become a movie reviewer, but I will make videos about the ones that really interest me or, or that I don't feel other people are appreciating a certain way. It's basically what I'm doing with LEGO Rewind, just trying to bring attention to things that I think are kind of underappreciated or uh, maybe people could have a new understanding of it and just documenting this stuff. Um, the thing is, I, I do also want to make a few game-related videos, but I don't want that to be the main thing that I do. But most importantly, I do want to start making videos about Planet Ripple. Um, not just trailers, but talking about the writing process or certain, certain things that I learned about making comics. Uh, about formatting and so on. And yes, I'll make a video about trademarking, that whole process, to help new authors just breaking into that. Um, so, you know, it, it, they're going to be in a very similar format of LEGO. It's just going to be tackling different subjects. And I realize that I'm probably going to have to rebuild my audience because I have gotten like, quite a few subscribers in the last couple of years from these Rewind videos. Uh, but every time you shift to a new type of content, a lot of those people don't carry over, you know, because they just wanted that first thing. They didn't want to see the other things you like to do. Uh, so hopefully, you know, I'll be able to rebuild something of an audience with, with that, um, with whatever I do next. It's just this is one of the reasons I don't want to try to keep Lego Rewind going on forever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. In that case, the next question is, uh, again, from the Dinosaur Planet, who asks... Since I made it a meme, and oh, okay, this might be more so for me. Uh, since I made it a meme and Keeney Hawkeye likes the topic, will we get a Borok jump scare scene in Biocraft? The, the movie's done. Isn't Biocraft done? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the movie's over. We're not going back to edit it. it Boy, it's, it's done. I still remember. I still remember that really old trailer you guys made, like what eight years ago, with um, with that song, uh, Hero. Yeah, I remember that one camera shot that like panned way out from the Kenny Nui. It was like, <laughs> I 
I'll tell you, you right now. I put up so much of a time. I never lot, imagined. It's a lot better now. <laughs> it's a okay, lot better yeah. than that now. But uh, any yeah. other questions? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, do, 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 do. Tesla Effect asks Nick, if you could go to Europe, what country would you pick to visit? Hmm. Probably France. Or, I mean, yeah, because I have like certain friends. And that's really all I have to say. Yeah, if I went to another country, like, I would want to be, you know, I want to be someplace where I know I have friends there. Um, that's reasonable. And I wouldn't, like, get lost, basically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jeremy Jason asks, Nick, did you ever get into mocking? Yes. I have made quite a few mocks. Uh, although I guess some don't really count. Some are just, like, heavy retoolings, where I take a character like, you know, a Glatorian and revamp them to look more organic, you know, throw some CCBS shells in there, just make them feel a little more complete than the original set did. Although, like, with the uh, Hero Factory, like, Invasion from Below sets, that inspired me to make several mech suits that were very different than the sets. And let's see. That's fair. All right. Uh, let me see. So Tesla Effect also mentioned that you have these mocks online. Mm. Also, Jeremy Jason asks, P.S. LJ, how's that mock of Kasi coming along? It is not done. In fact, it's not even started. <laughs> I have been way too busy to mock. However, I have been doing a lot of organization with a bunch of containers with pieces. So, it is something that I'm, I I want to be able to do it before Brick Fair, Virginia. Okay, so. we've got we've got two from Tesla Effect. Uh, Nick, yeah. do you have your own sig fig and self mock? No, I do not. Um, Nick, how do you how do you convince LJ to star in your recent Lego Rewind episode, and why did you choose Mega Bloks Dragons as the topic for the jokey video? Well, you may have noticed, but most of the things that I wrote about dragons were completely sincere. <laughs> like I did think many of those things about it. Um, I just I wanted to make an episode about something like that at some point. You know, I thought, oh man, it's too bad uh, dragons as Mega Bloks. That would be fun to make an episode about someday. So I just went for it. And, you know, I already told you, like, the process of convincing LJ to hop aboard, it barely took any convincing, really. It was just a fun project to, that we both jumped into. Indeed. Let's see. Um, Spidey Central Re asks, uh, have you ever seen Reviving Bionicle? If you have, hail Denmark. Yes, I have. Hail Denmark. It's very good. The Clone Ranger asks, do you like puns? Yes. Let's okay. see. Um... Good, good. And I actually... Okay, so there is one more question that we'll go ahead. This will be the last one from Tesla Effect. And he asks, Nick, will you review or talk about the cancelled Bionicle games uh, or the cancelled Bionicle game that fans recently got a beta version of, which would be Bionicle The Legend of Mass Nui? I think I, I will. I'll talk about it at some point. Um, my computer isn't that great, but I do plan to play it at some point and make some kind of review or analysis of it. I just don't feel it's right to do that yet. I want to make I want to wait until it's in a state that these guys are really proud of and that they can say that they're satisfied with, you know, like the final version. Because I might bring up certain things as like criticisms that would end up making, you know, a, a dated video because those things would eventually be fixed. I want to wait until they're all ironed out and it's like the version that these guys felt okay you know, like really releasing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Now, sorry, That's... there's one last thing I want to say before we end this. Hmm. Um, kind of a funny story. Anyone who's seen the new trailer that I just released a few days ago, um, there was a song. Yeah, I needed some cool music for that. And I, I thought of this one called Dreamscapes, composed by a guy named Hugo Flores, who was part of this band called Sonic Pulsar that was around for a few years, and then dis I think they disbanded uh, sometime in the, in the 2000s. And I used to listen to that song throughout like my teen years hundreds of times, still listen to it here and there, and I thought, man, that would be perfect for this, uh, but how do I get it? So I looked into the process of licensing a song for trailer usage, uh, things like a synchronization license, which allows you to do it one time uh, for a fee. And depending on how popular a band is, it can cost you thousands of dollars. Oof. Um, yeah. Uh, thankfully, um, I mean, 
this is where it got really complicated is that usually you would go through an agent or a record label you know whoever published it trying to contact the original artists the people who actually compose a song it's like trying to contact christian faber yeah um so the, the the funny thing is this band was only around for a little while they'd long since disbanded and this song was from the first of two albums and only the second album uh, was even properly like published through a, a record label so they didn't even own this one so i had to track down the original guy and he hadn't even like posted anything publicly in years so i thought ah he's never gonna get back to me it was a long shot but within days i heard back from him and it, it all worked out um he said it was fine for me to use it for this thing just as long as i like credited him I think he just appreciated that I even went through the trouble of asking him uh, that I even knew what things like a synchronization license were. Though I don't recommend just approaching somebody that way normally. I do recommend you like you learn the whole process and you try to contact them like you know any other way you can first. Uh, but the funny thing that happened afterwards, he he saw the trailer and he really liked it he was surprised by just how well the song did fit the story of planet ripple and he said those kinds of stories those like sci-fi mystery worlds were right up his alley and uh, i think he wants to buy the books now That's and fantastic. i'm just like what how does that happen like listening to that song in my teens years ago i never would have imagined that someday the guy who composed it would be interested in my books how does that happen? That is crazy. But yes, that's just one of the many stories that I could tell about people that wanted to help out with this project. Like once they knew what it was, what I was trying to do with it, they, you know, it jived with them. Like people just want to help make Planet Ripple a thing. And I can't thank them enough. That's fantastic. That is really, that, that is a really cool Story. Like even right now, this will make the video a bit dated. But uh, for the next two months, prints of like thirty different pieces of mine are hanging up at the public library, the Bangor Public Library, which you know, I'll be having my talk at. They're all along the stairwell towards the front of the place, so like people on every floor are going to see them. They're even like, what's called the teen room, which is you know like where all the books for like young adults and so on. They're even in that section, and ah, uh, it's just crazy because like. I swear, it really doesn't take that much convincing. Once people like knew what I was trying to do, they wanted to help out. Mm -hmm. And again, I just, I, I really appreciate it. Like I'm not saying it in a boastful way, I'm saying I feel lucky. Mm -hmm. Like I keep looking back and wondering, what did I even do to earn this kind of attention? You know, what did I do to, to like warrant this? And it's just what I am doing. Mm -hmm. And I guess I should stop being so surprised, though I don't want to be complacent, of course. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Well, that's fantastic. All Thank right. you. Okay, well, I think in that case, um, we're going to go and wrap things up. So, Nick, thank you so much for being here today and taking the time and and chatting. I'll, I'm sure that we'll have to have you on again to, to talk more of these subjects, especially after you've finished uh, Rewind, so we can do a Rewind on your Rewind. Yep. <laughs> oh man, you know, maybe we should do that because I don't think the situation with Planet Ripple is going to change that much in the next year though I will, you know, have released like Volume 6 like two years from now so maybe that would be a good time to talk about that. I think if mm -hmm. we do another episode anytime soon we'll make it like just about Rewind and all the good memories. Fair also, enough. maybe by that time I might even have finished the Toa because I do plan to get back to that very soon. It's just that these months are always the busiest for me out the whole year. But mm -hmm. I will jump into that before too long and hopefully finish it before I have to take another hiatus. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Uh, that being the case, are there any links to social media that you would like people to head to? Yes. On Twitter, I am Nick on Ripple. There was not enough word for planet. I am Nick on Planet Ripple on YouTube. I am Nick on Planet Ripple on DeviantArt. Uh, there's a Nick on I mean, there's a Planet Ripple page on Facebook. Um, there's a website. Uh, you can contact me through there. Like, you know, like that gets forwarded like to my email. Um, I have an Instagram called like Planet Ripple HQ. I have a Tumblr that I barely use now. 
Um, and my books are, of course, available on Amazon. All right. So that's basically everything, I think. Fantastic. In that case, I will have as many of those links in the description below. Again, I highly encourage you to go check them out. All Thank right. Thank you. So I think that about does it again, Nick. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And to everyone listening, thank you all so much for joining us, and hopefully you had a good time. This has been yet another episode of The LJ Johnson Show. This show airs every single weekend, every Saturday, at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, unless specified otherwise, over on Twitter, at The LJ Johnson, where you can find updates and guest announcements every single Tuesday. And if you have any questions over the week, make sure you head on over to my email, ljjohnson at gmail.com and you can ask me any questions you might have. Remember, that's J-O-H-N-S-E-N. All right, we're going to go ahead and head on out. Once again, thank you all so very much, and we'll see you again. Wait, last thing I want to say before I forget, because I forgot to say it last time, your intro music is really funny to me. Like I, it, the, the, it's like the musical equivalent of the visual of someone just tripping over themselves. <laughs> I guess yeah. what I see when I hear that. It's like someone dropped like a band down the stairs. <laughs> yeah, no, I really like it. <laughs> okay, bye everybody. All right, see you all next time.